Bound for Mesopotamia My adventure started off the coast of southern Italy in the city of Toronto. Reinforcements were being sent from England. The troops would arrive through the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. From there, they'd trek the entire path north. Others took a train through France and Italy across the Mediterranean into Egypt. They'd take the Suez Canal down the Red Sea to the Persian Gulf. The latter was shorter but more brutal given the rough terrain in the Mediterranean. Toronto was accessible through a thin channel less than 200 yards wide. The historic part of the town was built on top of a hill. Winding stone-capped roads wrapped through the town. Gravel alleys served as streets. We walked through the town, heard fishermen singing, whistling, and laughing. They enjoyed the day's mission ahead of them. We came to a stone archway with several women sitting around. They seemed to be generations of a family. One of the older women, the grandmother of the group, was blind. She sat knitting and sharing songs with her attentive family. The grandmother sang without pausing to breathe. I carried on and was pushed back to reality. The rest camps in Toronto, best described as neat rows of tents on top of dying grass, is where we waited for our orders. No one knew what the Navy commander had chosen for our fate. This campsite seemed more dismal than others. The commander was Admiral Mark Kerr. He led the Mediterranean troop. He decided who would join his crew on the HMS Queen, one of seven ships of the Royal Navy. I was chosen to be his guest. A marvelous opportunity. In the British Empire, the Navy was the highest-ranked service in the nation. It was easy to understand why the officers responded and acted the way they did. They were well-traveled and well-read. They shared stories of their adventures about the distinguished writers and statesmen they'd encountered along the way. We waited for the weather to break to make the journey as smooth as possible. The Admiral wrote poems along his journey. One that stood out was Prayer for the Empire, which the German Emperor respected. He ordered it distributed to the German naval recruits. The Kaiser's feelings toward the Admiral did eventually change. Luckily, the German Emperor heeded the original warning. There's no menace in preparedness, no threat in being strong. If the people's brain be healthy, and they think, no thought of wrong. After five days passing on the HMS Queen, we transferred to the Union Castle Line, a straight run to Busra in southern Syria. From there, we boarded a sub and steamed out of the harbor. Two small Japanese destroyers were there to protect us. We felt the rigidness of the submarine in the Adriatic. We only traveled at night for the first part of the voyage. It was difficult to explain how they maneuvered the submarine through the night. We made the journey and avoided collisions. The next afternoon was filled with preparation. We rehearsed how to abandon ship and located exits and lifeboats. We made emergency strategies for the unexpected. Some crew were put in charge of specific sections of the boat. They made sure everything was safe and the life rafts were in working order. As the sun dropped, the night dawned, and everyone off duty called in for the night. Three sharp blasts woke everyone on board after midnight, the international danger signal. We knew our orders. Each of us grabbed a life jacket and made our way to our deck stations. Everyone organized in perfect order. The entire squad sought information and direction. The ship's officer announced he heard the boat take on water. He disappeared for 20 minutes. Everyone was uneasy about what came next. The next boat over, I listened to a Scottish captain say with a twinge of excitement in his voice, It looks as if we could go down. I've seen a rat run along the ropes of my boat. Moments passed. The officer announced we weren't sinking. Our ship and one of the Japanese destroyers had collided. The impact hit above the water line. We later learned the Japanese ship, although hit, made it to port. 
After the collision, our ship docked for a few days in a harbor on the Albanian coast. We waited for a new destroyer to escort us. We enjoyed the downtime. The next night, we steamed on the HMS Queen to Navarino Bay, on the southwest edge of Greece. On board was Lieutenant Finch Hatton's grandfather, one of the officers who commanded the Allied forces in 1827. He helped remove the Turkish troops and establish Greek independence. A few days passed, and the HMS Queen arrived at Port Said in North Egypt on the Suez Canal. We sailed through the Suez and pushed on into the Red Sea. In August, this region was hot and well known for its tropical conditions. We had no ventilation system, no lighting. We were in a box of steam on water. We were short-handed, and some of the group was sent below. If transferred, you'd never take clean air for granted again. It was almost as if we inhaled humidity. Many crew members suffered from heat stroke. The medical areas of the crowded ship were not full service or sanitized. After our first casualty, the military burial at sea was impressive. A row of men with rifles, heads bowed. After a short, standard burial reading, the body, wrapped in a Union Jack, slid over the stern of the ship. As it ended, we heard the rings of bugles singing the tunes of Last Post. The last note of that song was a cue for the rest of the shipmen to sing Abide With Me. The next morning, we steamed down the Red Sea and into the Indian Ocean. We avoided contact with each other in case of another illness or virus that could spread among the crew. At that time, duties were light. We spent time reading, playing cards, and anything to pass the time, but also staying alert. The men playing the bugles would break to play a game called House from dusk until dawn. It was like a game of lottery, no skill required. Each player had squares of paper with numbers written on them. One person drew from a bag of papers marked with numbers. He called them out, and those with the same number cover it until all numbers have been covered. First to finish wins, and collects a penny from all other players. Another game was more popular but forbidden. Known as Crown and Anchor, the advantage lies in favor of the banker, but he makes too rich of a profit, and it's considered unfair. The HMS Queen sailed through the Strait of Ormuz, a strait between the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. For those who'd been through it, it was reminiscent of the days of European supremacy. When the Portuguese were lured to the Strait of Ormuz by a superior English force, the reinforcements never arrived. The Portuguese could only sail forth and attempt battle. The attempt was successful but not before joining with the two nearest admirals in their boats. The Portuguese commander sent the British a beautiful, crimson, ceremonial cloak. In return, the British sent back an engraved sword. They together made a pledge and threw their chalices into the sea. This goes to show what's changed in the last few centuries. An inspection of the maps and letters proved the geographical makeup was accurate. This made the troops hopeful. The map creator was one of the greatest Portuguese poets at the time. He wrote most of his masterpiece, The Lusiad, when exiled in India. For almost two decades prior, he led a fast life in the East. He described several harbors, curves of the shore, and smells of the sea in his beautiful pieces. Our next destination was Busra, Syria, about 60 miles from Shat al-Arab a name given by the Tigris and Euphrates after their Kurna tour, another 60 miles to the north. As we entered the river, there was a sandbar. It blocked traffic for large boats, like the ones in our convoy. This caused us to transfer to more accessible British Indian channels and vessels. We passed the island of Abadan, home of the Anglo-Persian Oil Company and its successful refineries. Vehicle transportation was valuable in this area. It kept the businesses afloat. There was no country living in the beginning. General Dixon, the director of local resources, encouraged the upkeep of agriculture. 
he suggested local farming and gathering as staples of life. Still, transportation would be necessary. Railroads took up double tracks. You could ride these trains from Busra to Amara and from Kut to Baghdad. But the stretch that combined the two had not been built, not until after the troops had left the country. Along the roads, we saw over 5,000 fords. On many of these trips, they took small groups of infantry to and from the base and destination. The cars would fit six, five men plus the driver. At this point, everyone was turned into a driver. We'd seen trolleys in France with Indian and Indo-Chinese drivers. It was something new, but didn't seem to faze many residents. Busra stood on the banks of Ashar Creek, the ancient city where Sinbad the sailor began his journey to the islands. Buried deep under the shifting sands of the desert floor, Busra was a port for the last few centuries. Before that, Kurna was the chief seaport, and the two nearest rivers joined in the nearby ocean. They'd enlarged the continent and pushed back the sea. The continent changed at 12 feet per year. It didn't seem to be slowing down any time soon. The town developed with the arrival of the expeditionary force. Most of the improvements needed were to fix the roads and valleys. It resulted in a permanent structure to go with the changes in the settling of the land. The British made striking improvements to the Mesopotamian region. If you want to conquer a country, you must develop it. The British built railways, roads, bridges, and power line systems. We wouldn't want to take over a country when it's run down. After landing in Busra, we had time to mingle and look around. We tried to gain our bearings. Bazaars were scattered across the land, also called souk by the Arabs. The best bazaars were in Busra. It wasn't pawn items or art treasures that attracted people. It was the way the salesmen approached, the way they'd sway you, how they grouped items together to encourage a bigger sale. Every type of person could be found in the narrow aisles of the bazaar. Arabs, Armenians, Indians, Kurds, Chaldeans, you name it. They gathered and lingered at these hot spots. Near the entrances were booths of lamps and lanterns. A Latin Ibn Said written above them, a reference to end slavery. A few days after arriving in Busra, we were given a paddle wheel boat. We used it to make our way upstream, 500 miles into Baghdad. Along the river banks stretched miles and miles of palm trees. The Arabs worked on the plants, fertilized them, and trimmed them. These trees depended on human contact to transfer pollen. At Kurna, a village in Egypt renamed Al Karna, we entered the Garden of Eden. I'll always remember this majestic sight and the feeling that I was walking through the pages of history. One of our crew members, Tommy, said, If this is the garden, it won't take no bloody angel with a flaming sword to take me back. It seemed not everyone shared my respect and wonder. Palm fronds fell from the trees. They were heard and seen everywhere. We watched as the natives feasted on the fruits. North of Kurna, the river was no longer lined with palm trees. It changed into a swampy smell, a desert-like feel, home to lizards and Arab marsh alligators. The gator would show himself, then slither back to water and safety once troop members got too close. On the banks of the Tigris lay Urza's tomb. It was in good condition a sacred and holy place to Muslims, Jews, and Christians alike. The next night, our paddleboat landed in Amara, Nubia. Nightfall was calm, and the wind had a slight chill. It was a relief for the desert-like conditions of the previous days. When we landed, we were free to scope out the land ashore. Down the bank and over the bridge, soldiers stood watch. They were clean, efficient, and on high alert. If anyone approached, we heard the echo of a booming, Halt! Who goes there? Outside of armored boats and monitors, river traffic was controlled by the Inland Water Transport Service, IWTS. The officers put in command there were pulled from all over. 
Most felt that nothing else mattered except what the officer of the IWTS would confirm while navigating. A light load, but enough to fulfill requirements. Everything from penny steamers to the Thames River craft would take that path. On the HMS Queen, it was customary to have barges attached to either side. The barges were filled with troops, horses, and supplies. Next would be the 1st Bengal Regiment, a new experiment by the current political parties. The Bengali were the Indians who quickly adapted to European ways. Rabindranath Tagore would be the most famous to do so. They went to Calcutta University and learned basic English language. They also learned general knowledge about the background of their destinations. This helped the Bengalis form the Babu class, many employed by the train system. They worked through the toughest vocabulary words. Afterward, they were ready to learn, grow, and adapt. As a race, they were taught to be vain but positive. They prepared to deal with any grievances against the British government. The British felt it would put them at ease to be recruited and sent to Mesopotamia. They started with drills and were eventually used for attacking Baghdad. Upon leaving Amara, we continued upstream. There was a boat a few hours ahead, but still only a couple hundred yards through the desert. The banks were extremely flat terrain. It made it appear other vessels were actually on land. The Arab River craft were flattering to the eye. At sunset, making headway with a full sail. The Arab women walked along the shore alongside the boat. They gathered baskets of eggs, chicken, and whatever the market had that day. From the boat, sailors tried to buy items, and it usually turned into a back-and-forth bartering. One night, the ship stopped, where not long ago, the last of the Suniat battles had been fought. For months, the British were held back. Their troops at Kut heard the first shots fired and hoped that those sounds would not get any closer. The first part of the campaign was treacherous, like the trench warfare in France. The week before was a failed attempt at an attack, right before the surrender of the garrison. A year later, the position would be assumed by another. This area had a gloomy presence, even for a battlefield. Tons of shell casings, unexploded grenades, and bones scattered the field. In Kut, it would be another 100 miles to get to Baghdad by train. It was better than taking the longer route through the curvy rivers and rough canals, a higher chance of being caught by shifting sandbars. At first look, Kut could be mistaken for unpromising land, blazing heat, and sand and mud houses. Despite the appearance, it was a thriving town. The railroads ran through the desert, following the old caravan route to Baghdad. Halfway through, we passed through Tesafin, almost 150 feet long and 80 feet wide. The arch stood 85 feet high and was surrounded by the ancient city now covered in sand mounds, incomparable to the more ancient Mesopotamia founded by Alexander the Great. On our first night in Baghdad, General Maud invited some of the sailors to his house on the river. He was a military-type man, well over six feet tall. His military career was impressive. He started out in the Coldstream Guards, making his identity in South Africa. Early in the current war, he was injured in France. While in recovery, he took over the 13th Division. He commanded the Gallipoli Campaign, which was later brought over to Mesopotamia. When he reached the east, the situation was unpleasant. General Townsend was surrounded in Kut, and the Turks came out successfully. At the end of August in 1916, four months after the fall of Kut, General Maud took over leadership of the Mesopotamian Armed Forces. The following year, on March 11th, he occupied Baghdad to re-establish British prestige. One of the biggest miscalculations made by Germany concerned the Indian situation. They tried to cause enough chaos to overturn British rule while keeping the English distracted with other uprisings. This caused a desire to send troops to India rather than another country. The Emir of Afghanistan likely did more than any other citizen to overtake the German intrigue. 
When General Maud assumed command, the Holy War had yet to end. The Holy War was preached in the mosques. Jihad proposed to unite only the most faithful believers to fight the invading Christians. They wanted to give the war a more religious tone. The Germans hoped this would lead to mutiny throughout the Mohammedan troops. This would hinder British forces and add fuel to the fire of the Turks. By trying to win over as many Arabs to their side as possible, the Turks oppressed the Arabs as well as the Orientals due to their brutal treatment. Under British rule, the playing field was more leveled out. When a race had been neglected for so long, it would suddenly find itself to be equal with its enemies. This caused a negative feeling on all sides. Most of the sailors read Arabian Nights in their younger years. They remembered the lure of the luxury and romance in the East. The glamour in that book would be far from reality. In the bright Mesopotamian sun, it looked rough and cheap. Many years were spent searching the foreign land, preparing systems and plans for the depressing times ahead. It's unfortunate the standard expectations have changed. What would approach from the south would now come from all directions. The view of the city seemed flat. Outside, the palm trees lined the seashore yet again, and the mosques towered above them. Further out were forests, flat roofs, and blue domes. The covered bazaars consumed many hours of our day. I'd sit for hours at a coffee shop and people watch through the windows. The lower-class Arab women, the veiled woman, and porters carrying their deliveries. Next door was a gold and silver market. Jews and Armenians hovered beside charcoal fires and haggled with customers and passerby. Many women carried their infants. It seemed impossible to me that the children with such a low immune system could survive in this place. They appeared to be well fed and in good health. Baghdad didn't become distinct until the 8th century. As the home of the Abbasid Caliphs, it was an influential position. Its greatness began toward the end of the 8th century under the rule of Harun al Rashid. It went on to be a center of commerce and industry. Still, it suffered from sieges and conquests, as many of the surrounding areas. In the year 1258, the Mongols captured Baghdad under the command of Genghis Khan. They held it for over 100 years, turned it over to the Turks, then Murad IV. After all these changes and the sight of many battles, it was not sought out by the caliphs. There's little stone in Mesopotamia, also called Cradle of the World. This was because of the traces of so many races and citizens that succeeded in ruling the land. When the Tigris height had gone down over the summer months, bricks would be dug out from its bank. Eighteen-inch squares that traced the seal of Nebuchadnezzar, all that remained before the arrival of the caliphs.